Chapter Twenty One A Black Ivory by R. M. Ballantyne. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty One Progress of the Slave Run, The Deadly Swamp, and the Unexpected Rescue. We will now leap over a short period of time, about two or three weeks, during which the sable procession had been winding its weary way over hill and dale, plain and swamp. During that comparatively brief period Harold and Disco had seen so much cruelty and suffering that they both felt a strange tendency to believe that the whole must be the wild imaginings of a horrible dream. Perhaps weakness resulting from illness might have had something to do with this peculiar feeling of unbelief, for both had been subject to a second though slight attack of fever. Nevertheless, coupled with their skepticism with a contradictory and dreadful certainty that they were not dreaming, but that what they witnessed was absolute verity. It is probable that if they had been in their ordinary health and vigor, they would have made a violent attempt to rescue the slaves, even at the cost of their own lives. But severe and prolonged illness often unhinges the mind as well as the body, and renders the spirit all but impotent. One sultry evening the sad procession came to a long stretch of swamp and prepared to cross it. Although already thinned by death, the slave gang was large. It numbered several hundreds, and was led by Marizano, Yusuf having started some days in advance in charge of a similar gang. Harold and Disco were by that time in the habit of walking together in front of the gang, chiefly for the purpose of avoiding the sight of cruelties and woes which they were powerless to prevent or assuage. On reaching the edge of the swamp, however, they felt so utterly wearied and dispirited that they sat down on a bank to rest, intending to let the slave-gang go into the swamp before them and then follow in rear. Antonio and Jumbo also remained with them. "'You should go on in front,' said Marizano significantly, on observing their intention. "'Tell him we'll remain where we are,' said Disco sternly to Antonio. Marizano shrugged his shoulders and left them. The leading men of the slave-gang were ordered to advance as soon as the armed guard had commenced the toilsome march over ground into which they sank knee-deep at every step. The first man of the gang hesitated and heaved a deep sigh as though his heart failed him at the prospect, and well it might for although young he was not robust and overdriving, coupled with the weight and the chafing of the goree had worn him to a skeleton. It was not the policy of the slave traders to take much care of their black ivory. They procured it so cheaply that it was easier and more profitable to lose or cast away some of it than to put off time in resting and recruiting the wheat. The moment it was observed, therefore, that the leading man hesitated, one of the drivers gave him a slash across his naked back with a heavy whip which at once drew blood. Poor wretch! He could ill bear further loss of the precious stream of life, for it had already been deeply drained from him by the slave-stick. The chafing of that instrument of torture had not only worn the skin off his shoulders, but had cut into the quivering flesh so that blood constantly dropped in small quantities from it. No cry burst from the man's lips on receiving the cruel blow, but he turned his eyes on his captors with a look that seemed to implore for mercy. As well might he have looked for mercy at the hands of Satan. The lash again fell on him with stinging force. He made a feeble effort to advance, staggered, and fell to the ground, dragging down the man to whom he was coupled with such violence as almost to break his neck. The lash was again about to be applied to make him rise, but Disco and Harold rose simultaneously and rushed at the driver, with what intent they scarcely knew, but four armed half-castes stepped between them and the slave. "'You had better not interfere,' said Marizano, who stood close by. "'Out of the way!' cried Harold fiercely, in the strength of his passion hurling aside the man who opposed him. "'You shan't give him another cut,' said Disco between his teeth as he seized the driver by the throat. "'We don't intend to do so,' said Marizano coolly, while the driver released himself from the poor Disco's weakened breast. He won't need any more. The Englishman required no explanation of these words. A glance told them that the man was dying. "'Cut him out,' said Marizano. 
one of his men immediately brought a saw and cut the fork of the stick which still held the living to the dying man, and which, being riveted on them, could not otherwise be removed. Harold and Disco lifted him up as soon as he was free, and carrying him a short distance aside to a soft part of the bank, laid him gently down. The dying slave looked as if he were surprised at such unwonted tenderness. There was even a slight smile on his lips for a few moments, but it quickly passed away with the fast ebbing tide of life. "'Go fetch some water,' said Harold. "'His lips are dry.' Disco rose and ran to fill a small coconut shell which he carried at his girdle as a drinking cup. Returning with it he moistened the man's lips and poured a little of the cool water on the raw sores on each side of his neck. They were so much engrossed with their occupation that neither of them observed that the slave gang had commenced to pass through the swamp until the sharp cry of a child drew their attention to it for a moment, but knowing that they could do no good they endeavored to shut their eyes and ears to everything save the duty they had in hand. By degrees the greater part of the long line had got into the swamp and were slowly toiling through it under the stimulus of the lash. Some, like the poor fellow who first fell, had sunk under their accumulated trials and after a fruitless effort on the part of the slavers to drive them forward had been kicked aside into the jungle, there to die, or to be torn in pieces by that ever-watchful scavenger of the wilderness, the hyena. These were chiefly women, who, having become mothers not long before, were unable to carry their infants and keep up with the gang. Others, under the intense dread of flagellation, made the attempt, and staggered on a short distance, only to fall and be left behind in the pestilential swamp, where rank reeds and grass closed over them and formed a ready grave. The difficulties of the swamp were, however, felt most severely by the children, who from little creatures of not much more than five years of age to well-grown boys and girls were mingled with and chained to the adults along the line. Their comparatively short legs were not well adapted for such ground, and not a few of them perished there. But although the losses here were terribly numerous in one sense, they after all bore but a small portion to those whose native vigor carried them through in safety. Among the men there were some whose strength of frame and fierce expression indicated untamable spirits, men who might have been, probably were, heroes among their fellows. It was for men of this stamp that the goree or slave stick had been invented, and most effectually did that instrument serve its purpose. Samson himself would have been a mere child in it. There were men in the gang quite as bold, if not as strong, as Samson. One of these, a very tall and powerful negro, on drawing near to the place where Marizano stood, superintending the passage, turned suddenly aside, and although coupled by the neck to a fellow slave, and securely bound at the wrist with a cord which was evidently cutting into his swelled flesh, made a desperate kick at the half-caste leader. Although the slave failed to reach him, Marizano was so enraged that he drew a hatchet from his belt and instantly dashed out the man's brains. He fell dead without even a groan. Terrified by this, the rest passed on more rapidly, and there was no further check till a woman in line with an infant on her back stumbled and falling down appeared unable to rise. "'Get up!' shouted Marizano, whose rage had rather been increased than abated by the murder he had just committed. The woman rose and attempted to advance, but seemed ready to fall again. Seeing this, Marizano plucked the infant from her back, dashed it against a tree, and flung its quivering body into the jungle, while a terrible application of the lash sent the mother shrieking into the swamp. Note, see Livingston Zambezi and its tributaries, page 857, and for a record of cruelties too horrible to be set down in a book like this, we refer the reader to MacLeod's Travels in Eastern Africa, Volume 2, page 26, also to the appendix of Captain Sullivan's Dow Chasing in Zanzibar Waters, which contains copious and interesting extracts from evidence taken before the select committee of the House of Commons. End of note. Harold and Disco did not witness this, though they heard the shriek of despair. 
for at the moment the negro they were tending was breathing his last. When his eyes had closed and the spirit had been set free, they rose, and purposely refraining from looking back, hurried away from the dreadful scene, intending to plunge into the swamp at some distance from the place, and push on until they should regain the head of the column. "'Better if we'd never fallen behind, sir,' said Disco in a deep, tremulous voice. "'True,' replied Harold. "'We should have been spared these sights, and the pain of knowing that we cannot prevent this appalling misery and cruelty.' "'But surely it is to be prevented somehow,' cried Disco, almost fiercely. "'Many a war that has cost mints of money has been carried on for causes that ain't worth mentioning in the same breath with this.' As Harold knew not what to say, and was toiling knee-deep in the swamp at the moment, he made no reply. After marching about half an hour, he stopped abruptly and said with a heavy sigh, "'I hope we haven't missed our way.' "'Hope not, sir, but it looks like as if we had.' I've been so took up thinking of that accursed traffic in human beings that I've lost my reckoning. Howsoever, we can't be far out, and with the sun to guide us, we'll... He was stopped by a loud halloo in the woods on the belt of the swamp. It was repeated in a few seconds, and Antonio, who with Jumbo had followed his master, cried in an excited tone, Me knows that sound. What may it be, Tony? There was neither time nor need for an answer for at that moment a ringing cry, something like a bad imitation of a British cheer, was heard, and a bang of men sprang out of the woods and ran at full speed towards our Englishmen. "'Why, Zombo!' exclaimed Disco wildly. "'Olivera!' cried Harold. "'Masico! Sangolo!' shouted Antonio and Jumbo. "'And Jose, Nakoda, Chimbola, Mabruco, the whole bun of them!' cried Disco as one after another these worthies emerged from the wood and rushed in a state of frantic excitement towards their friends. Hooray! Hooroo hey! replied the runners. In another minute our adventurous party of travelers was reunited, and for some time nothing but wild excitement, congratulations, queries that got no replies, and replies that ran tilt at irrelevant queries, with confusion worse confounded by explosions of unbounded and irrepressible laughter, not unmingled with tears was the order of the hour. "'But what, you's ill?' cried Zombo suddenly, looking into Disco's face with an anxious expression. "'Well, I ain't exactly ill, nor I ain't exactly well neither, but I'm hearty all the same, and very glad to see your black face, Zombo.' "'Ha! Hooroo! Hey! So me's for see you!' cried the excitable Zombo. "'But come, not good for talky in de knees to water. Fall in, boy, ho!' Shalorums, quick mash. That Zambo had assumed command of his party was made evident by the pat way in which he trolled off the words of command formerly taught to him by Harold, as well as by the prompt obedience that was accorded to his orders. He led the party out of the swamp and on reaching a dry spot halted in order to make further inquiries and answer questions. How did you find us, Zambo? asked Harold, throwing himself wearily on the ground. You's ill said Zambo, holding up a finger by way of rebuke. So I am, though not so ill as I look. But come, answer me. How came you to discover us? You could not have found us by mere chance in this wilderness. Chance? What am chance? asked the Makololo. There was some difficulty in getting Antonio to explain the word, from the circumstances of himself being ignorant of it. Therefore Harold put the question in a more direct form. Oh! We comes here look for you, cause people's dreckums show de way. We's been weeks, months, oh, days look for you. Travel far, wrong road, turnin' back, try again, find you now. Hooroo, hey! You may say that indeed. I'll have it in my heart, said Disco, to give three good rousin' British cheers if it weren't for the thoughts of that black-hearted villain Marizano and his poor miserable slaves. Marizano! shouted Chambolo, glaring at Harold. Marizano, echoed Zambo, glaring at Disco. Harold now explained to his friends that the slave hunter was close at hand, a piece of news which visibly excited them, and described the cruelties of which he had recently been a witness. Zambo showed his teeth like a savage mastiff, and grasped his musket as though he longed to use it, but he uttered no word until the narrative reached that point in which the death of the poor captive was described. Then he suddenly started forward, 
and said something to his followers in the native tongue, which caused each to fling down the small bundle that was strapped to his shoulders. "'You stop here,' he cried earnestly, as he turned to Harold and Disco. "'Ve's come back soon. Ho, oh, boys, shoulder ums, quick mash!' No trained band of Britons ever obeyed with more ready alacrity. No attention was paid to Harold's question. The quick mash carried them out of sight in a few minutes, and when the Englishmen who had run after them a few paces halted, under the conviction that in their weak condition they might as well endeavor to keep up with racehorses as with their old friends, they found that Antonio alone remained to keep them company. "'Where's Jumbo?' inquired Harold. "'Gone way with utters,' replied the interpreter. Examining the bundles of their friends, they found that their contents were powder, ball, and food. It was therefore resolved that a fire should be kindled and food prepared to be ready for their friends on their return. "'I'm not so sure about their return,' said Harold gravely. "'They will have to fight against fearful odds if they find the slavers. Foolish fellows, I wish they had not rushed away so madly without consulting us.' The day passed. Night came and passed also, and another day dawned, but there was no appearance of Zambo and his men until the sun had been up for some hours. Then they came back, wending their way slowly, very slowly, through the woods with the whole of the slave gang, men, women, and children at their heels. "'Where is Marizano?' inquired Harold, almost breathless with surprise. "'Dead,' said Zambo. "'Dead?' Ay, dead. Couldn't be deader. And his armed followers? Dead too. Some of them's. We got at em in de night. Shot at Marizano all to atoms. Shot at Mosab on followers too. De rest all scatter like leaves in de wind. Me give up now, added Zambo, handing his musket to Harold. Boys, orums, me's captain not no more. Now, Captain Harold, use once more look after us, and take care of all em's people. Having thus demitted his charge, the faithful Zambo stepped back and left our hero in the unenviable position of a half-broken-down man with the responsibility of conducting an expedition and disposing of a large gang of slaves in some unknown part of equatorial Africa. Leaving him there, we will proceed at once to the coast and follow, for a time, the fortunes of that arch-villain, Yusuf. End of chapter 21 Recording by Tom Weiss, Tom's Audiobooks dot com. Of Black Ivory by R. M. Ballantyne. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter twenty two describes Black Ivory at sea. Having started for the coast with a large gang of slaves a short time before Marizano, as we have already said, and having left the Englishmen to the care of the half-caste, chiefly because he did not desire their company, although he had no objection to the ransom, Yusuf proceeded over the same track which we have already described in part, leaving a bloody trail behind him. It is a fearful track of about five hundred miles in length, that which lies between the head of Lake Nyassa and the seacoast at Kilwa. We have no intention of dragging the reader over it to witness the cruelties and murders that were perpetrated by the slavers or the agonies endured by the slaves. Livingston speaks of it as a land of death, of desolation, and dead men's bones, and no wonder, for it is one of the main arteries through which the blood of Africa flows like the water of natural rivers to the sea. The slave gangs are perpetually passing eastward through it, perpetually dropping four-fifths of their numbers on it as they go. Dr. Livingston estimates that in some cases not more than one-tenth of the slaves captured reach the seacoast alive. It is, therefore, rather under than overstating the case to say that out of every hundred starting from the interior, eighty perish on the road. Yusuf left with several thousands of strong and healthy men, women, and children. Most of them being children, he arrived at Kilwa with only eight hundred. The rest had sunk by the way, either from exhaustion or cruel treatment, or both.' 
The loss was great, but as regards the trader it could not be called severe, because the whole gang of slaves cost him little, some of them even nothing, and the remaining eight hundred would fetch a good price. They were miserably thin indeed, and exhibited on their poor, worn, and travel-stained bodies the evidence of many a cruel castigation. But Yusuf knew that a little rest and good feeding at Kilwa would restore them to some degree of marketable value, and at Zanzibar he was pretty sure of obtaining, in round numbers, about ten pounds a head for them, while in the Arabian and Persian ports he could obtain much more if he chose to pass beyond the treaty-protected water at Lamu and run the risk of being captured by British cruisers. It is piracy to carry slaves north of Lamu. South of that point for hundreds of miles robbery, rapine, murder, cruelty such as devils could not excel if they were to try is a domestic institution with which Britons are pledged not to interfere. Since the above was written Sir Bartle Ferre has returned from his mission and we are told that a treaty has been signed by the Sultan of Zanzibar putting an end to this domestic slavery. We have not yet seen the terms of this treaty, and must go to press before it appears. We have reason to rejoice and be thankful, however, that such an advantage has been gained. But let not the reader imagine that this settles the question of East African slavery. Portugal still holds to the domestic institution in her colonies, and has decreed that it shall not expire till the year 1878 decreed, in fact, that the horrors which we have attempted to depict shall continue for five years longer, and let it be noted that the export slave trade cannot be stopped as long as domestic slavery is permitted. Besides this there is a continual drain of human beings from Africa through Egypt. Sir Samuel Baker's mission is a blow aimed at that, but nothing that we know of is being done in regard to Portuguese wickedness. If the people of this country could only realize the frightful state of things that exists in the African Portuguese territory, and knew how many thousand bodies shall be racked with torture, and souls be launched into eternity during these five years, they would indignantly insist that Portugal should be compelled to stop it at once. If it is righteous to constrain the Sultan of Zanzibar, is it not equally so to compel the King of Portugal? The arch-robber and murderer, Yusuf, smooth and oily of face, tongue, and manner, though he was, possessed a bold spirit and a grasping heart. The domestic institution did not suit him. Rather than sneak along his villainous course under its protecting pass, he resolved to bid defiance to laws, treaties, and men of war to boot, as many hundreds of his compeers have done and do and make a bold dash to the north with his eight hundred specimens of black ivory. Accordingly, full of his purpose, one afternoon he sauntered up to the barracoons in which his cattle were being rested and fed up. Musa, his chief driver, was busy among them with a lash, for like other cattle they had a tendency to rebel, at least a few of them had. The most of them were by that time reduced to the callous condition which had struck Harold and Disco so much on the occasion of their visits to the slave market of Zanzibar. Musa was engaged, when Yusuf entered, in whipping most unmercifully a small boy whose piercing shrieks had no influence whatever on his tormentor. Close beside them a large, strong-boned man lay stretched on the ground. He had just been felled with a heavy stick by Musa for interfering. He had raised himself on one elbow, while with his right hand he wiped away the blood that oozed from the wound in his head, and appeared to struggle to recover himself from the stunning blow. "'What has he been doing?' asked Yusuf carelessly in Portuguese. "'Oh, the old story, rebelling,' said Musa, savagely hurling the boy into the midst of a group of cowering children, amongst whom he instantly shrank as much as possible out of sight. That brute, pointing to the prostrate man, was a chief, it appears, in his own country, and has not yet got all the spirit lashed out of him. But it can't last much longer. Either the spirit or the life must go. He has carried that little whelp the last part of the way on his back, and now objects to part with him. Got fond of him, I fancy. If you had taken my advice you would have cast them both to the hyenas long ago. You are a bad judge of human flesh, Musa 
said Yusuf quietly. "'More than once you have allowed your passion to rob me of a valuable piece of goods. This man will fetch a good price in Persia, and so will his son. I know that the child is his son, though the fool thinks no one knows that but himself, and rather prides himself on the clever way in which he has continued to keep his wealth beside him on the journey down. Bah! What can one expect from such cattle? Don't separate them, Musa. They will thrive better together. If we only get them to market in good condition, then we can sell them in separate lots without risking loss of value from pining. In a somewhat sulky tone, for he was not pleased to be found fault with by his chief, the slave-driver ordered out the boy, who was little more than five years old, though the careworn expression on his thin face seemed to indicate a much more advanced age. Trembling with alarm, for he expected a repetition of the punishment, yet not daring to disobey, the child came slowly out from the midst of his hapless companions and advanced. The man, who had partly recovered, rose to a sitting position and regarded Musa and the Arab with a look of hatred so intense that it is quite certain he would have sprung at them if the heavy slave-stick had not rendered such an act impossible. "'Go, you little whelp,' said Musa, pointing to the fallen chief, and at the same time giving the child a cut with a whip. With a cry of mingled pain and delight poor Obo, for it was he, rushed into his father's open arms and laid his sobbing head on his breast. He could not nestle into his neck as in the days of old he had been wont to do. The rough goree effectually prevented that. Kambira bent his head over the child and remained perfectly still. He did not dare to move, lest any action, however inoffensive, might induce Musa to change his mind and separate them again. Poor Kambira! How different from the hardy, bold, kindly chief to whom we introduced the reader in his own wilderness home! His colossal frame was now gaunt in the extreme, and so thin that every rib stood out as though it would burst from the skin, and every joint seemed hideously large, while from head to foot his skin was crossed and recrossed with terrible wheels and scarred with open sores, telling of the horrible cruelties to which he had been subjected in the vain attempt to tame his untamable spirit. There can be no question that, if he had been left to the tender mercies of such Portuguese half-caste scoundrels as Musa or Marizano, he would have been brained with an axe or whipped to death long ago. But Yusuf was more cool and calculating in his cruelty. He had more respect for his pocket than for the gratification of his angry feelings. Therefore Kambira had reached the coast alive. Little had the simple chief imagined what awaited him on that coast, and on his way to it when in the fullness of his heart he had stated to Harold Seadrift his determination to proceed thither in search of Azinte. Experience had now crushed hope and taught him to despair. There was but one gleam of light in his otherwise black sky, and that was the presence of his boy. Life had still one charm in it as long as he could lay hold of Obo's little hand and hoist him, not quite so easily as of yore, on his broad shoulders. Yusuf was sufficiently a judge of human character to be aware that if he separated these two, Kambira would become more dangerous to approach than the fiercest monster in the African wilderness. "'We must sail to-night and take our chances,' said Yusuf, turning away from his captives. The time allowed for our trade is past, and I shall run straight north without delay. The Arab here referred to the fact that the period of the year allowed by treaty for the lawful slave trade of the Zanzibar dominions had come to an end. That period extended over several months, and during its course passes from the Sultan secured domestic slavers against the British cruisers. After its expiration no export of slaves was permitted anywhere. Nevertheless a very large export was carried on, despite non-permission and cruisers. Yusuf meant to run the blockade and take his chance. "'How many dows have you got?' asked Yusuf. Three, replied Musa. "'That will do,' replied the Arab after a few minutes' thought. "'It will be a tight fit at first, perhaps, but a few days at sea will rectify that.' Even in the most healthy season and favorable conditions we must unfortunately count on a good many losses. We shall sail tomorrow. 
The morrow came, and three dows left the harbor of Kilwa, hoisted their lateen sails, and steered northwards. They were densely crowded with slaves. Even to the eye of a superficial observer this would have been patent, for the upper deck of each was so closely packed with black men, women, and children that a square inch of it could not anywhere be seen. They were packed very systematically in order to secure economical stowage. Each human being sat on his haunches with his thighs against his breast and his knees touching his chin. They were all ranged thus in rows, shoulder to shoulder and back to shin, so that the deck was covered with a solid phalanx of human flesh. Change of posture was not provided for. It was not possible. There was no awning over the upper deck. The tropical sun poured its rays on the heads of the slaves all day. The dews fell on them all night. The voyage might last for days or weeks, but there was no relief to the wretched multitude. For no purpose whatever could they move from their terrible position, save for the one purpose of being thrown overboard when dead. But we have only spoken of the upper deck of these dows. Beneath this there was a temporary bamboo deck, with just space sufficient to admit of men being seated in the position above referred to. This was also crowded, but it was not the black hole of the vessel. That was lower still. Seated on the stone ballast beneath the bamboo deck there was yet another layer of humanity, whose condition can neither be described nor conceived. Without air, without light, without room to move, without hope, with insufferable stench, with hunger and thirst, with heat unbearable, with agony of body and soul, with dread anticipations of the future and despairing memories of the past, they sat for days and nights together, fed with just enough of uncooked rice and water to keep soul and body together. Not enough in all cases, however, for many succumbed, especially among the women and children. Down in the lowest, filthiest, and darkest corner of this foul hold sat Kambira, with little obo crushed against his shins. It may be supposed that there was a touch of mercy in this arrangement. Let not the reader suppose so. Yusuf knew that if Kambira was to be got to market alive, obo must go along with him. Musa also knew that if the strong-minded chief was to be subdued at all, it would only be by the most terrible means, hence his position in the Dao. There was a man seated alongside of Kambira who for some time had appeared to be ill. He could not be seen, for the place was quite dark, save when a man came down with a lantern daily to serve out rice and water. But Kambira knew that he was very ill from his groans and the quiverings of his body. One night these groans ceased, and the man leaned heavily on the chief. Not very heavily, however, he was too closely wedged in all round to admit of that. Soon afterwards he became very cold, and Kambira knew that he was dead. All that night and the greater part of next day the dead man sat propped up by his living comrades. When the daily visitor came down, attention was drawn to the body, and it was removed. Musa, who was in charge of this dhow, Yusu having command of another, gave orders to have the slaves in the holds examined, and it was discovered that three others were dead and two dying. The dead were thrown overboard, the dying were left till they died, and then followed their released comrades. But now a worse evil befell that dhow smallpox broke out among the slaves. It was a terrible emergency, but Musa was quite equal to it. Ordering the infected and suspected slaves to be brought on deck, he examined them. In this operation he was assisted and accompanied by two powerful armed men. There were passengers on board the dhow, chiefly Arabs, and a crew as well as slaves. The passengers and crew together numbered about thirty-four, all of whom were armed to the teeth. To these this inspection was of great importance, for it was their interest to get rid of the deadly disease as fast as possible. The first slave inspected, a youth of about fifteen, was in an advanced stage of the disease, in fact dying. A glance was sufficient, and at a nod from Musa the two powerful men seized him and hurled him into the sea. 
the poor creature was too far gone even to struggle for life. He sank like a stone. Several children followed. They were unquestionably smitten with the disease and were at once thrown overboard. Whether the passengers felt pity or no, we cannot say. They expressed none, but looked on in silence. So far the work was easy, but when men and women were brought up on whom the disease had not certainly taken effect, Musa was divided between the desire to check the progress of the evil and the desire to save valuable property. The property itself also caused some trouble in a few instances, for when it became obvious to one or two of the stronger slave girls and men what was going to be done with them, they made a hard struggle for their lives, and the two strong men were under the necessity of using a knife, now and then, to facilitate the accomplishment of their purpose. But such cases were rare. Most of the victims were callously submissive, it might not be beyond the truth in some cases to say willingly submissive. Each day this scene was enacted, for Musa was a very determined man, and full forty human beings were thus murdered, but the disease was not stayed. The effort to check it was therefore given up, and the slaves were left to recover or die where they sat. Note, see account of capture of Dow by Captain Robert B. K., of HMS Vulture in the Times of India, 1872. End of note. While this was going on in the vessel commanded by Musa, the other two dows under Yusuf and a man named Suleiman had been lost sight of, but this was a matter of little moment, as they were all bound for the same Persian port and were pretty sure British cruisers permitting to meet there at last. Meanwhile the dow ran short of water and Musa did not like to venture at that time to make the land, lest he should be caught by one of the hated cruisers or their boats. He preferred to let the wretched slaves take their chance of dying of thirst, hoping, however, to lose only a few of the weakness, as water could be procured a little farther north with greater security. Thus the horrible work of disease, death, and murder went on, until an event occurred which entirely changed the aspect of affairs on board the Dow. Early one morning Musa directed the head of his vessel towards the land with the intention of procuring the much-needed water. At the same hour and place two cutters belonging to H.M.S. Firefly, armed with gun and rocket, twenty men, and an interpreter, crept out under sail with the fishing boats from a neighboring village. They were under the command of Lieutenants Small and Lindsay, respectively. For some days they had been there keeping vigilant watch, but had seen no dows, and that morning were proceeding out rather depressed by the influence of hope deferred, when a sail was observed in the offing, or rather a mast, for the sail of the dow had been lowered, the owners intending to wait until the tide should enable them to cross the bar. "'Out oars and give way, lads,' was the immediate order, for it was necessary to get up all speed on the boats if the dow was to be reached before she had time to hoist her huge sail." I hope the haze will last, earnestly muttered Lieutenant Small in the first cutter. Oh, that they may keep on sleeping for five minutes more, excitedly whispered Lieutenant Lindsay in the second cutter. These hopes were coupled with orders to have the gun and rocket in readiness. But the haze would not last to oblige Mr. Small, neither would the Arabs keep on sleeping to please Mr. Lindsay. On the contrary, the haze dissipated and the Arabs observed and recognized their enemies when within about a half a mile. With wonderful celerity they hoisted sail and stood out to sea in the full swing of the monsoon. There was no little probability that the boats would fail to overhaul a vessel with so large a sail, therefore other means were instantly resorted to. Fire! said Mr. Small. Fire! cried Mr. Lindsay. Bang! went the gun, whiz! went the rocket almost at the same moment. A rapid rifle fire was also opened on the slaver, shot, rocket, and ball bespattered the sea and scattered foam in the air, but did no harm to the dow, a heavy sea and a strong wind preventing accuracy of aim. Give it them as fast as you can, was now the order, and well was the order obeyed, for blue jackets are notoriously smart men in action, and the gun, the rocket, and the rifles kept up a smart iron storm for upwards of two hours, during which time the exciting chase lasted. At last Jackson, the linguist who was in the stern of Lindsay's boat, 
mortally wounded the steersman of the dhow with a rifle ball at a distance of about six hundred yards not long afterwards the rocket cutter being less heavily weighted than her consort crept ahead and when within about a hundred and fifty yards of the slaver let fly a well-directed rocket it carried away the peril which secured the yard of the dhow to the mast and brought the sail down instantly on the deck hurrah burst irresistibly from the blue jackets the arabs were doubly overwhelmed for besides getting the sail down on their heads they were astonished and stunned by the shriek smoke and flame of the war rocket the gun cutter coming up at the moment the two boats ranged alongside of the slaver and boarded it together as we have said the crew and passengers numbering thirty-four were armed to the teeth and they had stood by the halyards during the chase with drawn creases swearing to kill anyone who should attempt to shorten sail these now appeared for a moment as though they meditated resistance but the irresistible dash of the sailors seemed to change their mind for they submitted without striking a blow though many of them were very reluctant to give up their swords and knives fortunately the firefly arrived in search of her boats that evening and the slaves were transferred to her deck but who shall describe the harrowing scene the dhow seemed a very nest of black ants it was so crowded and the sailors who had to perform the duty of removing the slaves were nearly suffocated by the horrible stench few of the slaves could straighten themselves after their long confinement indeed some of them were unable to stand for days afterwards and many died on board the firefly before they reached the harbor of refuge and freedom those taken from the hold were in the worst condition especially the children many of whom were in the most loathsome stages of smallpox and scrofula of every description they were so emaciated and weak that many had to be carried on board and lifted for every movement kambira although able to stand was doubled up like an old man and poor little obo trembled and staggered when he attempted to follow his father to whom he still clung as to his last and only refuge to convey these poor wretches to a place where they could be cared for was now captain romer's chief anxiety first however he landed the crew and passengers with the exception of musa and three of his men the filthy dhow was then scuttled and sunk after which the firefly steamed away for aden that being the nearest port where the rescued slaves could be landed and set free end of chapter twenty two Recording by Tom Weiss, Tom's Audiobooks dot com. Chapter twenty three of Black Ivory by R. M. Ballantyne. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter twenty three. The Remedy. Reader, we will turn aside at this point to preach you a lay sermon if you will lend an attentive ear. It shall be brief and straight to the point. Our text is Prevention and Cure. There are at least three great channels by which the lifeblood of Africa is drained. One trends to the east through the Zanzibar dominions, another to the southeast through the Portuguese dependencies, and a third to the north through Egypt. If the slave trade is to be effectually checked, the flow through these three channels must be stopped. It is vain to rest content with the stoppage of one leak in our ship if two other leaks are left open. Happily, in regard to the first of these channels, Sir Bartle Ferre has been successful in making a grand stride in the way of prevention. If the Sultan of Zanzibar holds to his treaty engagements, domestic slavery in his dominions is at an end nevertheless our fleet will be required just as much as ever to prevent the unauthorized piratical slave trade and this after all is but one-third of the preventive work we have to do domestic slavery remains untouched in the portuguese dependencies and portugal has decreed that it shall remain untouched until the year eighteen seventy eight it is well that we should be thoroughly impressed with the fact that so long as slavery in any form is tolerated, the internal, we may say infernal, 
miseries, and horrors which we have attempted to depict will continue to blight the land and brutalize its people. Besides this justice demands that the same constraint which we lay on the Sultan of Zanzibar should be applied to the King of Portugal. We ought to insist that his domestic slavery shall cease at once. Still further, as Sir Bartle Ferre himself has recommended, we should urge upon our government the appointment of efficient consular establishments in the Portuguese dependencies, as well as vigilance in securing the observance of the treaties signed by the sultans of Zanzibar and Muscat. A recent telegram from Sir Samuel Baker assures us that a great step has been made in the way of checking the tide of slavery in the third, the Egyptian channel, and Sir Bartle Ferre bears testimony to the desire of the Khedive that slavery should be put down in his dominions. For this we have reason to be thankful, and the appearance of affairs in that quarter is hopeful but our hope is mingled with anxiety because mankind is terribly prone to go to sleep on hopeful appearances our nature is such that our only chance of success lies under god in resolving ceaselessly to energize until our ends be accomplished we must see to it that the khedive of egypt acts in accordance with his professions and for this end efficient counselor agency is as needful in the northeast as in the southeast. So much for prevention, but prevention is not cure. In order to accomplish this two things are necessary. There must be points or centers of refuge for the oppressed on the mainland of Africa, and there must be the introduction of the Bible. The first is essential to the second. Where anarchy, murder, injustice, and tyranny are rampant and triumphant, the advance of the missionary is either terribly slow or altogether impossible. The life-giving, soul-softening word of God is the only remedy for the woes of mankind, and therefore the only cure for Africa. To introduce it effectually and along with it civilization and all the blessings that flow therefrom, it is indispensable that Great Britain should obtain, by treaty or by purchase, one or more small pieces of land there to establish free Christian Negro settlements, and there with force sufficient to defend them from the savages, and worse than savages, the Arab and Portuguese half-caste barbarians and lawless men who infest the land, hold out the hand of friendship to all natives who choose to claim her protection from the man-stealer, and offer to teach them the blessed truths of Christianity and the arts of civilization." Many of the men who are best fitted to give an opinion on the point agree in holding that some such center or centers on the mainland are essential to the permanent cure of slavery, although they differ a little as to the best localities for them. Take, for instance, Dar es Salaam on the coast, the Manganja Highlands near the River Shire, and Khartoum on the Nile. Three such centers would, if established, begin at once to dry up the slave trade at its three fountainheads, while our cruisers would check it on the coast. In these centers of light and freedom the Negroes might see exemplified the blessings of Christianity and civilization, and thence trained native missionaries might radiate into all parts of the vast continent, armed only with the word of God, the shield of faith, and the sword of the Spirit in order to preach the glad tidings of salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord. In brief, the great points on which we ought as a nation to insist are the immediate abolition of the slave trade in Portuguese dependencies, the scrupulous fulfillment of treaty obligations by the sultans of Zanzibar and Muscat, the Shah of Persia, and the Khedive of Egypt the establishment by our government of efficient consular agencies where such are required, the acquisition of territory on the mainland for the purposes already mentioned, and the united action of all Christians in our land to raise funds and send men to preach the gospel to the Negro. So doing we shall, with God's blessing, put an end to the eastern slave trade, save equatorial Africa, and materially increase the commerce, the riches, and the happiness of the world. End of chapter 23. Recording by Tom Weiss, 
tomsaudiobooks.com. Chapter 24 of Black Ivory by R. M. Ballantyne. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 24 Tells of Sad Sights and Sudden Events and Unexpected Meetings. In the course of time, our hero Harold Seadrift and his faithful ally, Disco Lillehammer, after innumerable adventures which we are unwillingly obliged to pass over in silence, returned to the coast and, in the course of their wanderings in search of a vessel which should convey them to Zanzibar, found themselves at last in the town of Governor Litoti. Being English travelers, they were received as guests by the governor, and Harold was introduced to Signorina Margarita. Passing through the marketplace one day they observed a crowd round the flagstaff in the center of the square, and following the irresistible tendency of human nature in such circumstances, ran to see what was going on. They found that a slave was about to be publicly whipped by soldiers. The unhappy man was suspended by the wrist from the flagstaff, and a single cord of coir round his waist afforded him additional support. "'Come away! We can do no good here,' said Harold in a low, sorrowful tone, which was drowned in the shriek of the victim as the first lash fell on his naked shoulders. "'Perhaps he's a criminal,' suggested Disco as he hurried away, endeavoring to comfort himself with the thought that the man probably deserved punishment. "'It's not the whippin' I think so much of,' he asked. "'That is the only thing as will do for some characters. But it's the awful cruelties that goes along with it.' Returning through the same square about an hour later, having almost forgotten about the slave by that time, they were horrified to observe that the wretched man was still hanging there. Hastening towards him, they found that he was gasping for breath. His veins were bursting and his flesh was deeply lacerated by the cords with which he was suspended. He turned his head as the Englishmen approached and spoke a few words which they did not understand. But the appealing look of his bloodshot eyes spoke a language that required no interpreter. At an earlier period in their career in Africa, both Harold and Disco would have acted on their first impulse and cut the man down. But experience had taught them that this style of interference, while it put their own lives in jeopardy, had sometimes the effect of increasing the punishment and suffering of those whom they sought to befriend. Acting on a wiser plan, they resolved to appeal to Governor Letoti in his behalf. They therefore ran to his residence where Margarita, who conversed with Harold in French, informed them that her father was in the Garissa or public palaver house. To that building they hastened and found that it was in the very square they had left. But Signor Litoti was not there. He had observed the Englishman coming and, having a shrewd guess what their errand was, had disappeared and hid himself. His chief officer informed them that he had left the town early in the morning and would not return till the afternoon. Harold felt quite sure that this was a falsehood, but of course was obliged to accept it as truth. "'Is there no one to act for the governor in his absence?' he asked anxiously. No, there was no one, but after a few minutes the chief officer appeared to be overcome by Harold's earnest entreaties and said that he could take upon himself to act, that he would suspend the punishment till the governor's return, when Harold might prefer his petition to him in person. Accordingly the slave was taken down. In the afternoon Harold saw the governor and explained that he did not wish to interfere with his province as a magistrate, but that what he had witnessed was so shocking that he availed himself of his privilege as a guest to pray that the man's punishment might be mitigated. Governor Letoti's health had failed him of late, and he had suffered some severe disappointments in money matters, so that his wanted amiability had been considerably reduced. He objected at first to interfere with the course of justice, but finally gave a reluctant consent, and the man was pardoned. Afterwards, however, when our travelers were absent from the town for a day, 
the wretched slave was again tied up and the full amount of his punishment inflicted. In other words, he was flogged to death. For the incident on which this is founded we are indebted to the Reverend Dr. Ryan, late bishop of the Mauritius. This incident had such effect on the mind of Harold that he resolved no longer to accept the hospitality of Governor Letoti. He had some difficulty, however, in persuading himself to carry his resolve into effect, for the governor, although harsh in his dealing with the slave, had been exceedingly kind and amiable to himself, but an unexpected event occurred which put an end to his difficulties. This was the illness and sudden death of his host. Poor disconsolate Margarita, in the first passion of her grief, fled to the residence of the only female friend she had in the town, and refused firmly to return home. Thus it came to pass that Harold's intercourse with the Signorita was cut short at its commencement, and thus he missed the last opportunity of learning something of the fortunes of Zinte. For it is certain that, if they had conversed much together, as would probably have been the case had her father lived, some mention of the slave girl's name could not fail to have been made, and their mutual knowledge of her to have been elicited and interchanged. In those days there was no regular communication between one point and another of the east coast of Africa and the neighboring islands. Travelers had frequently to wait long for a chance, and when they got one were often glad to take advantage of it without being fastidious as to its character. Soon after the events above narrated, a small trading schooner touched at the port. It was bound for the Seychelles, intending to return by Zanzibar and Madagascar and proceed to the Cape. Harold would rather have gone direct to Zanzibar, but having plenty of time on his hands as well as means, he was content to avail himself of the opportunity and took passage in the schooner for himself, Disco, and Jumbo. That sable and faithful friend was the only one of his companions who was willing to follow him anywhere on the face of the earth. The others received their pay and their discharge with smiling faces and scattered to their several homes, Antonio departing to complete his interrupted honeymoon. Just before leaving Harold sought and obtained permission to visit Margarita to bid her good-bye. The poor child was terribly overwhelmed by the death of her father and could not speak of him without giving way to passionate grief. She told Harold that she meant to leave the coast by the first opportunity that should offer and proceed to the Cape of Good Hope, where, in some part of the interior, lived an old aunt, the only relative she now had on earth who she knew would be glad to receive her. Our hero did his best to comfort the poor girl and expressed deep sympathy with her, but felt that his power to console her was very small indeed. After a brief interview he bade her farewell. The voyage which our travelers now commenced was likely to be of considerable duration, for the Seychelles Islands lie a long way to the eastward of Africa, but as we have said time was of no importance to Harold and he was not sorry to have an opportunity of visiting a group of islands which are of some celebrity in connection with the East African slave trade. Thus all unknown to himself or Disco, as well as to Margarita, who would have been intensely interested had she known the fact, he was led towards the new abode of our sable heroine, Azinte. But alas, for Cambira and Obo, they were being conveyed also, of course, unknown to themselves or to anyone else, further and further away from one whom they would have given their heart's blood to meet with and embrace, and it seemed as if there was not a chance of any gleam of light bridging over the ever-widening gulf that lay between them, for although Lieutenant Lindsay knew that Azinte had been left at the Seychelles, he had not the remotest idea that Cambira was Azinte's husband and among several hundreds of freed slaves the second lieutenant of the Firefly was not likely to single out and hold converse with a chief whose language he did not understand, and who, as far as appearances went, was almost as miserable, sickly, and degraded as were the rest of the unhappy beings by whom he was surrounded. 
Providence, however, turned the tide of affairs in favor of Kambira and his son. On reaching Zanzibar Captain Romer had learned from the commander of another cruiser that Aden was at that time somewhat overwhelmed with freed slaves, a considerable number of captives having been recently made about the neighborhood of that great rendezvous of slavers, the island of Socotra. The captain therefore changed his mind and once more very unwillingly directed his course towards the distant Seychelles. On the way thither many of the poor negroes died, but many began to recover strength under the influence of kind treatment and generous diet. Among these latter was Kambira. His erect gait and manly look soon began to return, and his ribs, so to speak, to disappear. It was otherwise with poor Obo. The severity of the treatment to which he had been exposed was almost too much for so young a frame. He lost appetite and slowly declined, notwithstanding the doctor's utmost care. This state of things continuing until the firefly arrived at the Seychelles, Obo was at once conveyed to the hospital which we have referred to as having been established there. Azinte chanced to be absent in the neighboring town on some errand connected with her duties as nurse, when her boy was laid down on his bed beside a number of similar sufferers. It was a sad sight to behold these little ones. Out of the original eighty-three children who had been placed there, forty-seven had died in three weeks, and the remnant were still in a pitiable condition. While on their beds of pain, tossing about in their delirium, the minds of these little ones frequently ran back to their forest homes, and while some in spirit laughed and romped once more around their huts, thousands of miles away on the banks of some African river, others called aloud in their sufferings for the dearest of all earthly beings to them, their mothers. Some of them also whispered the name of Jesus, for the missionary had been careful to tell them the story of our loving Lord while tending their poor bodies. Obo had fevered slightly, and in the restless half-slumber into which he fell on being put to bed, he too called earnestly for his mother. In his case, poor child, the call was not in vain. Lieutenant Lindsay and the doctor of the ship with Cambira had accompanied Obo to the hospital. Now, Lindsay, said the doctor, when the child had been made as comfortable as circumstances would admit of, this man must not be left here, for he will be useless, and it is of the utmost consequence that the child should have some days of absolute repose. What shall we do with him? Take him on board again, said Lindsay. I dare say we shall find him employment for a short time. If you will allow me to take charge of him, interposed the missionary, who was standing by them at the time, I can easily find him employment in the neighborhood, so that he can come occasionally to see his child when we think it's safe to allow him. That will be the better plan, said the doctor, for as long as a short sharp cry near the door of the room cut the sentence short. All eyes were turned in that direction, and they beheld a zinte gazing wildly at them, and standing as if transformed to stone. The instant Kambira saw his wife he leaped up as if he had received an electric shock, bounded forward like a panther, uttered a shout that did full credit to the chief of a warlike African tribe, and seized the zinte in his arms. No wonder that thirty-six little black heads leaped from thirty-six little white pillows and displayed all the whites of seventy-two eyes that were anything but little when this astonishing scene took place. But Kambira quickly recovered himself, and grasping Azinte by the arm, led her gently towards the bed which had just been occupied, and pointed to the little one that slumbered uneasily there. Strangely enough, just at the moment little Obo again whispered the word, Mother! Poor Azinte's eyes seemed ready to start from their sockets. She stretched out her arms and tried to rush towards her child, but Kambira held her back. Obo is very sick, he said. You must touch him tenderly. The chief looked into his wife's eyes, saw that she understood him, and let her go. Azinte crept softly to the bed, 
knelt down beside it and put her arms so softly round Obo that she scarcely moved him. Yet she gradually drew him towards her until his head rested on her swelling bosom and she pressed her lips tenderly upon his brow. It was an old familiar attitude which seemed to pierce the slumbers of the child with a pleasant reminiscence and dissipate his malady, for he heaved a deep sigh of contentment and sank into profound repose. Good, said the doctor in a low tone, with a significant nod to Lindsay, when an interpreter had explained what had been already guessed by all present, that Kambira and Azinte were man and wife. Obo has a better chance now of recovery than I had anticipated, for joy goes a long way towards effecting a cure. Come, we will leave them together. Kambira was naturally anxious to remain, but like all commanding spirits he had long ago learned that cardinal virtue, obedience to whom obedience is due. When it was explained to him that it would be for Obo's advantage to be left alone with his mother for a time, he arose, bowed his head, and meekly followed his friends out of the room. Exactly one week from that date little Obo had recovered so much of his former health that he was permitted to go out into the air, and a few days later Lieutenant Lindsay resolved to take him and his father and mother on board the Firefly by way of a little ploy. In pursuance of this plan he set off from the hospital in company with Kambira, followed at a short distance by Azinte and Obo. Poor Lindsay, his heart was heavy while he did his best to convey in dumb show his congratulations to Kambira, for he saw in this unexpected reunion an insurmountable difficulty in the way of taking Azinte back to her former mistress, not that he had ever seen the remotest chance of his being able to achieve that desirable end before this difficulty arose. But love is at times insanely hopeful, just as at other times, and with equally little reason, it is madly despairing. He had just made some complicated signs with hands, mouth, and eyebrows, and had succeeded in rendering himself altogether incomprehensible to his sable companion, when, on rounding a turn of the path that led to the harbor, he found himself suddenly face to face with Harold Seadrift, Disco Lillehammer, and their follower Jumbo, all of whom had landed from a schooner which, about an hour before, had cast anchor in the bay. "'Mr. Lindsay! Mr. Seadrift!' exclaimed each to the other simultaneously, for the reader will remember that they had met once before when our heroes were rescued from Yusuf by the Firefly. "'Kambira!' shouted Disco. "'Azinte!' cried Harold as our sable heroine came into view. Obo, roared the stricken mariner. Jumbo could only vent his feelings in an appalling yell and an impromptu war-dance round the party, in which he was joined by Disco, who performed a hornpipe with Obo in his arms, to the intense delight of that convalescent youngster. Thus laughing, questioning, shouting, and dancing, they all effervesced towards the shore like a band of lunatics just escaped from Bedlam. End of chapter 24. Recording by Tom Weiss, Tom's Audiobooks dot com. Chapter 25 of Black Ivory by R. M. Ballantyne. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 25. The Last. How comes it, said Lieutenant Lindsay to Harold, on the first favorable opportunity that occurred after the meeting described in the last chapter, how comes it that you and Kambira know each other so well? I might reply by asking, said Harold with a smile, how comes it that you are so well acquainted with Azinte? But before putting that question I will give you a satisfactory answer to your own. Hereupon he gave a brief outline of those events already narrated in full to the reader, which bore on his first meeting with the slave-girl and his subsequent sojourn with her husband. After leaving the interior, continued our hero, 
and returning to the coast I visited various towns in order to observe the state of the slaves in the Portuguese settlements, and truly what I saw was most deplorable. Demoralization and cruelty and the obstruction of lawful trade prevailed everywhere. The settlements are to my mind a very pandemonium on earth. Everyone seemed to me more or less affected by the accursed atmosphere that prevails. Of course there must be some exceptions. I met with one at the last town I visited, in the person of Governor Litodi. Litodi? exclaimed Lindsay, stopping abruptly. Yes, said Harold in some surprise at the lieutenant's manner, and a most amiable man he was. Was? Was? What do you mean? Is, is he dead? exclaimed Lindsay, turning pale. He died suddenly just before I left, said Harold. And Margarita, I mean his daughter, what of her? asked the lieutenant turning as red as he had previously turned pale. Harold noted the change and a gleam of light seemed to break upon him as he replied, "'Poor girl! She was overwhelmed at first by the heavy blow. I had to quit the place almost immediately after the event.' "'Did you know her well?' asked Lindsay, with an uneasy glance at his companion's handsome face. "'No, I had just been introduced to her shortly before her father's death, and have scarcely exchanged a dozen sentences with her. It is said that her father died in debt, but of course in regard to that I know nothing, certainly. At parting she told me that she meant to leave the coast and go to stay with a relative at the Cape. The poor lieutenant's look on hearing this was so peculiar, not to say alarming, that Harold could not help referring to it, and Lindsay was so much overwhelmed by such unexpected news and withal so strongly attracted by Harold's sympathetic manner, that he straightway made a confidant of him, told him of his love for Margarita, of Margarita's love for Azinte, of the utter impossibility of his being able to take Azinte back to her old mistress now that she had found her husband and child, even if it had been admissible for a lieutenant in the British Navy to return freed negroes again into slavery, and wound up with bitter lamentations as to his unhappy fate and expressions of poignant regret that fighting and other desperate means, congenial and easy to his disposition, were not available in the circumstances. After which explosion he subsided, felt ashamed of having thus committed himself, and looked rather foolish. But Harold quickly put him at his ease. He entered on the subject with earnest gravity. "'It strikes me, Lindsay,' he said thoughtfully, after the lieutenant had finished, that I can aid you in this affair, but you must not ask me how at present. Give me a few hours to think over it, and then I shall have matured my plans. Of course the lieutenant hailed with heartfelt gratitude the gleam of hope held out to him, and thus the friends parted for a time. That same afternoon Harold sat under a palm tree in company with Disco, Jumbo, Cambira, Azinte, and Obo. "'How would you like to go with me to the Cape of Good Hope, Cambira?' asked Harold abruptly. "'Where dat?' asked the chief through Jumbo. "'Far away to the south of Africa,' answered Harold. "'You know that you can never go back to your own land now, unless you want to be again enslaved.' "'Him say him no want to go back,' interpreted Jumbo. "'Got all him care for now, Azinte and Obo.' "'Then do you agree to go with me?' said Harold. To this Cambira replied heartily that he did. "'Why, what do we mean for to do with them?' asked Disco in some surprise. "'I will get them comfortably settled there,' replied Harold. "'My father has a business friend in Cape Town who will easily manage to put me in the way of doing it. Besides, I have a particular reason for wishing to take Azinte there. Ask her, Jumbo, if she remembers a young lady named Signorina Margarita Litotti. To this Azinte replied that she did, and the way in which her eyes sparkled proved that she remembered her with intense pleasure. "'Well, tell her,' rejoined Harold, "'that Margarita has grieved very much at losing her, and is very anxious to get her back again, not as a slave, but as a friend, for no slavery is allowed in English settlements anywhere, and I am sure that Margarita hates slavery as much as I do, though she is not English.' so I intend to take her and Cambira and Obo to the Cape where Margarita is living 
or will be living soon. "'Ye don't stick at trifles, sir,' said Disco, whose eyes on hearing this assumed a thoughtful, almost a troubled look. "'My plan does not seem to please you,' said Harold. "'Please, sir, why shouldn't it please me? In course you knows best. I was only a little puzzled, that's all.' Disco said no more, but he thought a good deal, for he had noted the beauty and sprightliness of Margarita and the admiration with which Harold had first beheld her, and it seemed to him that this rather powerful method of attempting to gratify the Portuguese girl was proof positive that Harold had lost his heart to her. Harold guessed what was running in Disco's mind, but did not care to undeceive him as, in doing so, he might run some risk of betraying the trust reposed in him by Lindsay. The captain of the schooner being bound for the Cape after visiting Zanzibar was willing to take these additional passengers, and the anxious lieutenant was induced to postpone total and irrevocable despair, although Margarita being poor, and he being poor, and promotion in the service being very slow, he had little reason to believe his prospects much brighter than they were before poor fellow. Time passed on rapid wing, as time is notoriously prone to do, and the fortunes of our dramatist Porsone varied somewhat. Captain Romer continued to roam the eastern seas, along with brother captains, and spent his labor and strength in rescuing a few hundreds of captives from among the hundreds of thousands that were continually flowing out of unhappy Africa. Yusuf and Musa continued to throw a boatload or two of damaged cattle in the way of the British cruisers as a decoy, and succeeded on the whole pretty well in running full cargoes of valuable black ivory to the northern markets. The Sultan of Zanzibar continued to assure the British Council that he heartily sympathized with England in her desire to abolish slavery, and to allow his officials, for a consideration, to prosecute the slave trade to any extent they pleased. Portugal continued to assure England of her sympathy and cooperation in the good work of repression, and her subjects on the east coast of Africa continued to export thousands of slaves under the protection of the Portuguese and French flags, styling them free engages. British Indian subjects, the Banyans of Zanzibar, continued to furnish the sinews of war which kept the gigantic trade in human flesh going on merrily. Murders, etc., continued to be perpetrated, tribes to be plundered, and harps to be broken, of course legally and domestically, as well as piratically, during this rapid flight of time. But nearly everything in this light has its bright lights and half-tints, as well as its deep shadows. During the same flight of time humane individuals have continued to urge on the good cause of the total abolition of slavery, and Christian missionaries have continued, despite the difficulties of slave trade, climate, and human apathy, to sow here and there on the coasts the precious seed of gospel truth, which we can trust shall yet be sown broadcast by native hands throughout the length and breadth of that mighty land to come more closely to the subjects of our tale. Chimbolo, with his recovered wife and child, sought safety from the slavers in the far interior, and continued to think with pleasure and gratitude of the two Englishmen who hated slavery, and who had gone to Africa just in the nick of time to rescue that unhappy slave who had almost been flogged to death, and was on the point of being drowned in the Zambezi in a sack. Mokompa, also continued to poetize, as in the days gone by, having made a safe retreat with Chimbolo, and among other things enshrined all the deeds of the two white men in native verse. Yambo continued to extol play, admire, and propagate the life-sized jumping-jack to such an extent that unless his career had been cut short by the slavers, we fully expect to find that creature a domestic institution when the slave trade has been crushed and Africa opened up, as in the end it is certain to be. During the progress and continuance of all these things you may be sure our hero was not idle. He sailed, as proposed, with Cambira, Azinte, Obo, Disco, and Jumbo for Zanzibar, touched at the town over which poor Signor Francisco Alfonso Toledo Bignosi Litoti had ruled, 
found that the signorina had taken her departure, followed, as Disco said, in her wake, reached the Cape, hunted her up, found her out, and presented to her, with Lieutenant Lindsay's compliments, the African chief Kambira, his wife Azinte, and his son Obo. Poor Margarita, being of a passionately affectionate and romantic disposition, went nearly mad with joy, and bestowed so many grateful glances and smiles on Harold that Disco's suspicions were confirmed, and that bold mariner wished her, Margarita, at the bottom of the sea, for Disco disliked foreigners and could not bear the thought of his friend being caught by one of them. Margarita introduced Harold to her aunt, a middle-aged, leather-skinned, excessively dark-eyed daughter of Portugal. She also introduced him to a bosom friend at that time on a visit to her aunt. The bosom friend was an auburn hair, fair-skinned, cheerful, spirited English girl. Before her Harold Seadrift at once, without an instant's warning, fell flat down, figuratively speaking, of course, and remained so, stricken through the heart. The exigencies of our tale require, at this point, that we should draw our outline with a bold and rapid pencil. Disco Lillehammer was stunned, and so was Jumbo when Harold, some weeks after their arrival at the Cape, informed them that he was engaged to be married to Alice Gray, only daughter of the late Sir Eustace Gray, who had been M.P. for some country in England, which he had forgotten the name of, Alice not having been able to recall it, as her father had died when she was four years old, leaving her a fortune of next to nothing a year, and a sweet temper. Being incapable of further stunning, Disco was rather revived than otherwise, and his dark shadow was resuscitated when Harold added that Cambira had become Margarita's head gardener, Azinte cook to the establishment, and Obo page in waiting, more probably page in mischief, to the young signorina. But both Disco and Jumbo had a relapse from which they were long of recovering when Harold went on to say that he meant to sail for England by the next mail, take Jumbo with him as valet, make proposals to his father to establish a branch of their house at the Cape, come back to manage the branch, marry Alice, and reside in the neighborhood of the Signorita Margarita Litotti's dwelling. "'You means what you say, I suppose,' asked Disco. "'Of course I do,' said Harold. "'And you're going to take Jumbo as your wally?' "'Yes.' "'Hm. I'll go too as your keeper.' "'My what? Your keeper, your straight basket buckler. For if you ain't a lunatic you ought to be.' But Disco did not go to England in that capacity. He remained at the Cape to assist Cambira at the express command of Margarita and continued there until Harold returned, bringing Lieutenant Lindsay with him as a partner in the business, until Harold was married and required a gardener for his own domain, until the Signorina became Mrs. Lindsay, until a large and thriving band of little Cape colonists found it necessary to have a general storyteller and adventure recounter with a nautical turn of mind, until, in short, he found it convenient to go to England himself for the gal of his heart who had been photographed there years before, and could be rubbed off neither by sickness, sunstroke, nor adversity. When Disco had returned to the colony with the original of the said photograph, and had fairly settled down on his own farm, then it was that he was wont at eventide to assemble the little colonists round him, light his pipe, and, through its hazy influence, recount his experiences and deliver his opinions on the slave trade of East Africa. Sometimes he was pathetic, sometimes humorous, but, however jocular he might be on other subjects, he invariably became very grave and very earnest when he touched on the latter theme. "'There's only one way to cure it,' he was wont to say, "'and that is to bring the Portuguese and Arabs to their marrow bones, put the fleet on the east coast in better work and order, have councils everywhere with orders to keep their weather eyes open to the slave dealers, start two or three British settlements, ports of refuge, on the mainland, hoist the Union Jack, and last, but not least, send them the Bible. We earnestly commend the substance of Disco's opinions to the reader, for there is urgent need for action. There is death where life should be, ashes instead of beauty, 
desolation in place of fertility, and even while we write, terrible activity in the horrific traffic in black ivory. This is the end of Black Ivory by R. M. Ballantyne. Recording by Tom Weiss, Tom's Audiobooks dot com.